Hey, Lincoln High School Chamber Choir. I'm Grant Edwards. I'm music director of First Congregational Church on the Park Blocks, and I'm also tonal director of Bond Organ Builders here on Gleason Street, where we build pipe organs like this one, and this one, and even like this one. <laughs> And Mrs. Raffel asked me to teach you a few things about tuning. Now you've probably heard that singing is better when done in tune. But what does that mean? Now it's not safe right now to get a bunch of singers together in the same room. And plus you might have to feed them. So instead I've got a bunch of organ pipes here, which will do exactly what I want them to do. Unlike singers a lot of the time. So first of all, how do we hear when two pitches are out of tune or dissonant? Well, when two sound waves are out of pitch, they create audible beats in the air. These are actual physical disturbances of the air molecules. It's not psychological or cultural in any way. It physically happens. In fact, if I were to play a pitch into one earphone and then a pitch that didn't quite match in the other one, Oh, I'd be able to tell that they were out of tune, but no air would be disturbed, only my brain. So I would hear no physical beats. If I drew two sound waves on paper that were slightly out of tune, they would look like this. Since sound waves are simply regular oscillations of air density, they're represented by peaks and valleys like a sine wave we see here a solid line representing one pitch with its peaks labeled one, two, three, four, and a second pitch represented by the dotted line, which is slightly flatter with its valleys marked one, two, three, four at the bottom. Now, since these two pitches are out of tune, they do not coincide. However, once in a while, the peaks do coincide, and this creates an audible thump or beat in the air represented at letter B in this graph. Now the more out of sync the two sound waves are, the more frequent the beats. In fact, when two pitches are quite out of tune, the beats are so frequent that they can almost sound like a pitch in themselves. This comes across as a growling or grinding sound in your ear. Okay, enough of that. Make it stop! And that is how we sense that two pitches are out of tune with each other. Now let me play you two organ pipes that are slightly out of tune. You hear that wavering? Those are, that wavering is actual beats in the air, disturbances of air molecules. Here, I'll make it even worse. And now, I'll put the, and now I'll put the pipes into tune. There you go. In tune. Now most people have a pretty good understanding that music and math are related. And the ancient Greeks knew this. Pythagoras in the 6th century BC demonstrated that when consonant intervals are played on strings or on pipes, the lengths of the strings or pipes, and therefore the tones, have simple mathematical relationships to each other. Ptolemy of Alexandria in the first century AD also showed that tuning was best when the ear and ratio theory agreed. Therefore, remember, consonance is an actual physical property of the world. It is a law of physics, not a matter of opinion, psychology, or culture. Now I've tuned middle C here, which is a pipe about two feet long, and uh, the C an octave higher, guess how long that pipe is? Well, an octave higher, that would be uh, one foot long, just about, because to make a pipe an octave higher, you make it half as long. Pretty simple. The problem is when you start playing chords on these things, eh, it doesn't work out quite right. The organ pipes don't do what I want.
like singers a lot of the time. Now I've purposefully tuned all of these pipes to be a little bit too long, so they're all flat. You know, like singers often are. So let's get G in tune with C. Here we go, no beats, perfectly in tune. And of course I can tune the D above the G now that G is in tune. take a while? There are 12 pitches in an octave, and if I keep going up by fifths... 12 fifths is a lot of fifths. It would take me seven octaves, or almost a whole piano keyboard to stack them up. To tune from C to shining C, as it were. That's why when tuning, it's easier to just drop a fourth every other time rather than keep going up. Now I'm going to tune the whole octave of pipes, which is 12 pipes, um, using the circle of fifths. Make it stop! It takes a while to get through the circle of fifths, so let's not and say we did. And there's, we've reached the C that's an octave higher. Now, theoretically, these two Cs should be in tune, right? I tuned all the fifths and the fourths perfectly. Let's see. Just like a singer, out of tune. How can this be? Now, out of tune octaves sound really bad, actually. But how can this be? Because the fourths and the fifths are really well in tune. Really good. Not good. Well, let's take a gander at this visual representation of the tuning I just performed. If we stack 12 fifths on each other, the resulting pitch seven octaves higher is a quarter semitone sharp than it should be. This quarter semitone disparity is known as the Pythagorean comma, depicted as a wedge in my graphic. This is the root of the problem of keyboard tuning, as well as just intonation in singing. Today, in equal temperament tuning, as on a normal piano, this comma is divided by 12 and subtracted equally from all fifths, rendering them about two cents flat. So when we're tuning a keyboard instrument for reals, uh, we obviously can't have the fifths in tune like this. But instead, we have to make every fifth slightly flat so that the octave turns out OK. So now you can hear that all the fourths and fifths are just slightly out of tune. They're a little flat. Now that's tolerable. You might not want to sing that out of tune, but listen to the thirds. grinding sound? They're beats that are so fast they almost make a regular rhythm. You really don't want to sing that out of tune, do you? Well, sometimes we have to. You know how choir directors are always telling you, lift that third, Sing that third nice and sharp. They're actually asking you to sing out of tune. In fact, the thirds are so out of tune, it takes me this much to get them flat enough. So the difference between the equal 
single tuning, and this is about a sixth of a half step. That's a lot. You don't want to sing a sixth of a half step out of tune all the time. Trust me. So what can be done about this problem? During the Renaissance, which was about 1450 to about 1650, somewhere in there, um, they wanted the thirds to sound really well in tune. This was very important to them. So there are solutions they came up with, such as just tuning the thirds perfectly in tune. C to E are perfectly in tune. Now E to G sharp. And we know C and C have to be in tune. Which they are. In the early Renaissance, Composers such as Ockeghem and Dunstable experimented with harmonies rich in major thirds and minor sixths. Unfortunately, pure thirds and pure fifths don't get along very well. Pure thirds are quite flat in comparison with tempered thirds, which is the opposite of pure fifths, which are slightly sharp. Since keyboard music first began to flourish during the Renaissance, instrument builders sought a solution so that their thirds would not sound so dissonant. In figure four here, the intervals are depicted as bricks that do not line up, unless the bricks are either stretched or a brick of a larger size is inserted somewhere, which would sound out of tune. Instrument builders tried to make the thirds in common keys that is, with the least number of accidental keys, pure, while sacrificing the purity of the fifth and certain less frequently encountered thirds. But what happens now when I play G sharp to C? That should be a major third, shouldn't it? That is not in tune. And then when we test G sharp to C sharp, for example. That's just terrible, ghastly, hideous. So in this Renaissance tuning system, we have some really nice sounding thirds in here. These are very common intervals, C to E, E to G sharp, G to B, and so on. And those are perfectly in tune. We've sacrificed the fifths, though. Isn't that interesting? Some of the fifths are sacrificed quite a bit. But in the Renaissance, they thought that was OK, as long as those thirds were in tune. But, but could they get all of the thirds in tune? Not that one. Certainly not that one. And that's the worst of all. It's called the wolf because it growls. And there's actually more than one wolf because if we play the fifth from G sharp to D sharp, Well, that's not acceptable at all. So what we've done is we've sacrificed some keys in order that the more common keys can sound better, but you can't play in A flat. Now here's the problem for singers. You want the C and E to be in tune, and so you, if you're singing the E, you will tune to the person singing the C. But remember, this E is really flat compared to what a piano keyboard would be if you're actually singing it in tune. The problem happens when the E becomes a reference to another pitch, such as the fifth. Now you can hear how that A is not in tune with the E because the E is flat since it's in tune with C. So let's tune the A. So 
there, but that A is really flat. So now if we tune the F to the flat A, that F is going to be flat too, right? So you can probably imagine as this continues, the pitch will just get flatter and flatter and flatter. That's why choir directors are always asking you to lift the pitch. They're actually asking you to sing out of tune. So the rule of thumb is, just don't go flat.